Amen. So keep your place in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll get there in a minute. But this morning, I want to explain to you um, some things that you're seeing in the world today and why you're seeing those things so you can be aware um, of what you're looking at. Um, I'm going to read for you Daniel chapter 4. This is something in verse number 4, or Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4. You don't have to turn there. Um, I've talked about um, knowledge um, increasing many times um, as regards to the end times and things that um, we're seeing today. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, and verse number 4, the Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So I'm talk I've talked a lot about that, on the, the increase of knowledge that we're seeing um, today in today's world. We've never seen anything like this in the history um, of mankind, that just such available knowledge everywhere um, through the internet and other things. But this morning, um, I want to talk about um, something that's related to but different and something that we're seeing everywhere in our lives today. And I want to talk about convergence this morning. You say, what is, what is convergence? What do you mean? I want to talk about convergence. I want to talk about convergence. What does that word mean? Convergence means if you have two lines that are converging, that means those two lines will eventually, they will meet, right? Um, convergence um, in general means coming together, union, um, things that are um, going to meet at some point. Um, and I want to talk to you about convergence this morning, and I want to talk to you about how not only is knowledge increasing um, a sign of the end times, but also convergence is a sign of the end times. So we're seeing that everything is converging today. You say, give me some examples. I'll give you some examples. Um, first of all, um, technology is converging. Okay, technology is converging. Um, an example of technology converging, a very simple example from my um, you know, maybe my generation is the clock radio. Uh, the clock radio is two converging technologies. You had a, a clock, some, some company made clocks and some company made a radio and they got together and they put these two things together and now you have a clock radio. You younger people are probably like, what's a clock radio? But here, here's, another, here's another good one for you. Um, I, have a, I have a battery pack. I was actually going to bring it today, but I have this little lithium battery pack. It's about this big. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tiny. And this thing, it'll jumpstart your car. It'll, I mean, it'll save my bacon more times than I can tell you. But, um, you know, it'll, it'll jumpstart your car. It's a little energy lithium battery pack that has enough energy to start um, even a V8 engine. And, but also, it's not just a battery pack. It's got a compass on it. It's got a flashlight on it. It's got all sorts of different devices that can charge cell phones and all these different things. It's, it's all this converged technology into this cool little box. I mean, I love stuff like this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gadget. Whenever you say something has gadget factor, which I've said a billion times, it means it does all these different things. Okay, here's another thing. Here's another thing of converged technology. And the only reason I would ever have it up here is because of, um, as, a, as an example, Th this. What is this? This is a phone, right? Is this even a phone anymore? I mean, this is a computer. This is a, you know, a communication device for every type of different thing. It's every video game that you could ever probably have or want is right here. It's a, it's a television. It's, I mean, it's all this converged technology right in this little tiny box. Some of you have converged this, uh, this device into like your social life. Your social life, has con this thing has become your best friend. It, it's so converged, right? As a matter of fact, I mean, this isn't even, I mean, I mean it can, you can have a conversation with this thing. It will literally listen to you and respond back to you. Right, but some of you, I mean, it's, it's I mean, Brother Johannes, I'm going to use you as an example. Come up here. Come up here. Let's have a conversation, Brother Johannes. So, Brother Johannes, let me, I mean, this is how converged the cell phone has become, okay? And how, how important it has become to some people. Let's have a conversation. How, how's work, brother? How's everything going at the job? How are the people that you work with? Or, are you learning anything? W what's going on? It's good. Yeah, I'm learning. Uh, the people okay. I work with are pretty good. Learning how to fire, install fire alarms and stuff. I like it a lot. But, uh, yeah, I'm learning a lot of different things, how to pull cable, all the different devices. 
I'm really liking it. Hang on, I'm trading some stocks right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cool to see all the different trades, how it all goes together. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, you see my point, though. All right. I mean, was there anything ruder than that? I'm basically, I'm talking to my friend, and then I pull out my best friend. And I'm like, hey, pause. I'm talking to my best friend now. But this is a seriously converged device. That really doesn't have much to do with the sermon. But I'm, I'm you know, there, it's a problem. Okay, it's become so converged and so, quote unquote, useful that, you know, it's just, uh, it's, anyway. But it's not just technology that I want to talk about this morning. Everything is converging. Businesses are converging. Companies are converging. Uh, in the news this last week, Amazon just bought MGM or some entertainment company. I mean, what does delivering packages and shopping have to do with entertainment? But what they're doing is they're getting into a different type of business. They're converging their company. What is, what is an electric car have to do with going to space, but it's a converging company. What does you know, shopping online have to do with sending people to space? It's just converging companies. They're, they're doing more and more things. So I'm just trying, that's what I want to talk about this morning, is just everything is converging. I want to prime your thought with just that idea of convergence. So to understand my problem and your problem with convergence, the first thing that we need to do is we need to do a little Bible study. We need to do a little Bible study. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We need to do a little bit of Bible study on Satan to understand the problem with convergence. So the goal here, the goal here and the goal with the Sunday morning sermons is to give you something that's relevant. Something that can make you, you know, more aware. Look, as a Bible-believing Christian, you, if you understand the Bible, you should have a completely aware view of what's happening around you. Nothing should surprise you. You shouldn't be confused about why you're seeing certain things and why the things that are happening in this world are happening. And that's the goal of, you know, the Sunday morning sermons, many of the sermons here. But look, you should be leaps ahead of unsaved people when it comes to just your ideas and understanding of what's happening around you. Let's do a little bit of a Bible study on Satan so we can understand um, where I'm headed with this topic of convergence. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verse number, let's start at verse number 3. The Bible says this, it says, let, let's look at what Satan's role is first. What is Satan's role in the world? What is his role? But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, lowercase g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So notice it says, in whom. It says, in whom the God of this world. Look, this verse, this verse, in whom? Who? Of them that believe not. These are people that are not saved. These are people that are not believers. Okay, and we see a definite contrast between the gospel here. I don't want to give it away, but we see a definite contrast between the gospel and this God of this world, lowercase g. Okay, so look, it's super important, but this verse here is showing you the power that Satan has over unbelievers. The God of this world has power over the unsaved. So, Satan has power over the unbelievers, okay? You say, well, I mean, how, I mean, we're saved. We're saved, so it's fine. Well, it's not really fine. We'll get to there in, in a few minutes. But turn to Luke chapter 13. So, you say, I mean, the, the 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is saying that the God of this world is blinding the minds of those that do not believe, that believe not, the unsaved. You say, well, okay, we're saved, but here's the thing. How many people are saved versus how many people are unsaved? Let's go ahead and look at it in Luke chapter 13. I mean, the, the disciples actually asked Jesus this question. And this is like one of those things that's super clear in the Bible and nobody understands it. You go out soul winning and you're like, are most people going to heaven? And everyone's like, I think so. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to heaven. You know, everyone's like, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm going to heaven. And what do you have to do? I mean, how bad do you have to be to, to, to not go to heaven? Well, I think if you ask for forgiveness, everyone goes to heaven. Everyone believes this. Everyone believes this. But look what the Bible says. The disciples actually asked Jesus this question. Then said one unto him, Lord, verse 23, are there few that be saved? 
This disciple is saying, Jesus, are most people going to heaven? And look what Jesus said to him. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Straight, not meaning straight as an arrow, but straight like the Straits of Hormuz. Or this, it's a narrow passageway. Straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Jesus says here, and then he says in other places, that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life, Jesus says. I mean, look, if you're a soul winner, you know this. How many doors do you have to knock? Look, I, I put it at 99% of the world. 99% of the world, in my opinion, is unsaved. How many doors do you have to knock? We have, 40, we have 40 home maps, typically. How many doors do you have to knock before you find a saved person? Do you find one saved person per map? Okay, let's say you find two saved people per map. That's 95% of people that are unsaved. Look, folks, the vast majority of this world is unsaved. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. So, Satan has power over the unsaved. He has blinded the minds of people that aren't saved. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And, and that is the vast majority. It's not even close. It's not even close. That is the vast majority of people in this world today. The God of this world is a ruler over most people in the world. Is the situation that we find ourselves in. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And you he hath quickened, who were dead in trespass and sins, where in time past, when you were unsaved, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's another name for Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Once again, the unsaved. Saying again there that, you know, the, the Satan has power over the unsaved. Look, Satan works and operates through unbelievers, is what the Bible is telling us here, which is most people. Right. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. So where is Satan? So we see that he's, he's ruling over, he has influence over, and he operates through the children of disobedience, the unsaved. Where is he? It, does Satan, is Satan in hell ruling over hell right now? Is Satan, you know, the, the ruler of hell? I'd rather be a, a, a ruler in hell than a servant in heaven. It's like, what in the world? That's nowhere in the Bible. Satan is not in hell. Satan has no control over hell. God created hell. Satan is not in hell. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number 8. Where is he then? If he's not in hell, I mean, look, he's eventually going to be in hell. Okay, he's eventually going to be in the lake of fire. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. If he's not in hell, where is he? I mean, he's real. He's a real being. Where is he at? Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. May devour. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Look, folks, he's here. The reason, there's a reason it was called the God of this world is because he's here. He is operating through unbelievers on this earth with us right alongside us look at revelation chapter 20. look i mean eventually eventually we know where he's going look at revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10 the bible says and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Eventually, God is going to throw him in hell. Throw him in the lake of fire. Sorry. All right? But look, we see that he has control or influence over the unsaved of this world and that he's operating, he's active. As a roaring lion, he's active in this world. There's going to be a time that this ends. Okay, that's good news. But for now... God is allowing it. God is allowing it. You say, why? Well, look, turn to John chapter 12. You say, why, why is God allowing it? You know, to understand this, we must understand that there is an opposing force here. Okay, so the devil is operating 
through the vast majority, he's on this earth operating. You know, he, he's running his business on this earth now. And he has the vast majority of people to operate through. But to understand why God allows it, we must understand that there's an opposing force. Look at John chapter 12 and verse 31. John chapter 12 and verse number 31. The Bible says, Now the judgment of this world, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, again, Satan, be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. This is Jesus. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus said, him being put up on the cross, he will draw all men to him. This shows the opposing positions of Jesus and Satan, is what this shows. They are opposites. And guess what? God allows free will. I mean, God's a libertarian, libertarian in this sense. That he, he allows free will. And this is why he allows this for now. He allows Satan to operate on this world for now. But look, he draws all men to himself. And we could do a Bible study on that. We could talk about how God gives every man a conscience. God gives every man a conscience. He writes the law in his heart. We studied this through in Romans. We see that God has, has created this world and, and creation is a witness to God. Creating is a, is a witness for us to see and matches our conscience, so we should be seeking for God because there's evidence of Him everywhere. Amen. So look, Jesus draws all men to Himself, but God allows free will. God allows free will. It's, it's your choice. Look, your belief... I, had, I gave the Gospel to somebody last week, and they said before I even started giving them the Gospel, they said to me, and I was kind of explaining them this person um, was not Christian. They were of a different religion. And I was explaining the difference between works and belief before I even got into the gospel. I just wanted to throw that concept out to them. And this person even said to me, before I even got into the gospel, they said, the thing about your belief is it's completely yours. I'm like, exactly. I can take everything from you. I can force you to do anything. I can... But what is completely yours that no one can take from you, force upon you, is what you believe. I can make you say something. I can make you sign something. I mean, horrible people throughout history have done this type of thing. But your belief, what you believe, is completely yours. And that is why God allows free will. Because it's all about belief. What you believe. So what do we see so far? Look, unbelievers will be without excuse. Right. Unbelievers will be without excuse because of the fact that God has already given them a head start. He's given everyone a conscience. He's given everyone the creation to see. What they believe is their choice. What they believe, and, and He draws men to Himself. And what they believe is completely up to them. So we see, number one, that Satan rules unbelievers. Okay, He's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says. We see that he's number two. We see he's operating in the world right now. And he has the majority of people to operate through. And we see number three, that he is an opposing force to Jesus. He is an opposing force to the gospel. Now let's talk about convergence this morning. I already talked to you about technology, business, all these things are convert. I mean, it seems, it seems harmless enough. It seems harmless enough. I mean, I like cool gadgets. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, is this good? I mean, it's more productive, maybe to, to have things combined into two different things. You know, technological convergence in many ways provides cool things. And then it provides a, a converging atmosphere in the workplace where maybe a department that used to do a certain thing, maybe now all departments do things, but then it turns into something else. Let's talk about another type of convergence that we're seeing today. How about what is moral and what is immoral? How about moral convergence? Are we seeing this today? Moral convergence? Look, I mean, it started in this country, if you just want to step through it, it started in this country with the, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It started in this country in the 1960s, the 1970s, 
and you know just this idea of fornication you know I guess people would call it people would call it the sexual revolution in the 60s and the 70s in this country you know and it's basically the acceptance of fornication is what happened turn to 1st Corinthians chapter 7 1st Corinthians chapter 7 look at verse number 2 what does the Bible say though what does the Bible say this is what's happening in our country but what does the Bible say nevertheless verse number 2 to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife let every woman have her own husband so here we see we see uh, uh, we see we don't see convergence here we see a separation we see a separation between fornication and marriage we see that they're competing they're competing ideas they do not converge the Bible here takes them look where they converge in our world today the Bible takes them and pulls them apart it says fornication no marriage yes is what the Bible says they're opposing ideas the Bible is for one and against the other instead we see open fornication which means what it means the putting off of marriage it means the putting off look at uh, Pew Re let me read you the latest from Pew Research look what um, research today says the share of adults who have lived with a romantic partner this is being in fornication is now higher than the share who have ever been married married adults are more satisfied with their relationships more trusting of their partners young adults are particularly accepting of cohabitation this means it's gonna get worse not better 78 percent of those ages 18 to 29 say it's completely acceptable for an unmarried couple to live together 78 percent of people of this age group in the United States let me just break that down for you have no problem with fornication this is converging morality folks look this is what's happened to first Corinthians chapter 5 look I mean that's completely different than what the Bible says I mean the Bible says I mean look they're just all oh, just there's nothing wrong with it you must just accept it just I mean look what the Bible the Bible says in first Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11 it says but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an adulterer or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner with such an one know not to eat look people are the Bible is commanding us to not even allow somebody that's in this type of situation to be in the church that's how serious it is the Bible speaks against fornication everywhere Old Testament New Testament again and again and again but the moral convergence amongst us amongst our society continues fornication I mean you see you see things converging do you see how convergence is not a good thing the 80s now well, we talked about the 60s and the 70s maybe that was just a fluke maybe that was just a fluke and things are gonna get better in the 80s in the 90s what do we see it comes homosexuality and all this unnatural behavior uh, of things that I don't even I'm not even sure I understand it all anymore in 1996 70 I mean and I'm gonna use I'm gonna use um, homosexual marriage as just a, as a as a as a gauge okay homosexual marriage and the idea of it was the biggest trick pulled on Christians since I can't even remember the last one it's like talking about a, a elephant that flies you ever seen a flying elephant let's talk about homosexual marriage in 1996 70 percent of the people in this country were opposed to it today 75 percent of the people are for it talk about convergence convergence it's all converging folks look folks every society that has ever fallen has gone through this same cycle so yes this will be this will be a sign of the end times that's true and I'll get to that in a minute but look every single society that has gone you know that has fallen has gone through this same cycle you think we'd figure it out go read on the Roman emperors go read on the Caesars sometime I can't even I can't even bring the things up I can't even mention the things that that society went through and we're heading down the same exact path 
You know what else? You know what follows after this? You know what always follows after this? Violence. Con you say, nah, we're never going to accept. We will never, we will never accept violence in this country. We will never converge on our violence is bad. Go out on the street and ask any 18 to 29 year olds, are you for violence? And they'll say no. But the greatest trick the devil ever tr played was convincing people that he wasn't real. Are they, look, all these people that are following Satan, I'm not saying they all, they're not all Satan worshipers, but they're following him all the same. Right. Somebody that is, that is for abortion? Is there any, I preached a whole sermon on this, is there any better, look, violence is harming the innocent. And guess what? The Roman society, our society following the same thing. You know what? You know, who, you know where the violence always starts? With the most innocent. Always. The children. It always starts against... Because, I mean, they're, they're the most defenseless. I guess it makes sense. If you're somebody that wants to commit violence, you know, the most defenseless thing out there is a, is a baby is a child. Look, if you support violence, if you support abortion, you're for violence. Right. You've converged and you probably don't even know it. You've converged your morality. But all this stuff, this, this, this immorality, the fornication leading to unnaturalness always leads to violence. And it always starts with the children. Always. Go, look, go, go do a... Go do a um, I mean, newsflash, folks, our society is going to get more and more violent. Yeah. I mean, I hate to break it to you. Right. But it's going to get more and more. Go do a search on, on sex offenders in your neighborhood. I mean, I, it'll ruin your day. And then you go and you can, you can find out what each of these people um, are, you know, why they're on this registry. And you know what? The vast majority of it, it it's, it's crimes against children. There's nothing more violent than that type of crime against children. And look, I, I, don't, I don't like talking about this stuff. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't like talking about it. Turn to, as a matter of fact, turn to Ephesians uh, chapter, turn to Ephesians chapter five. Turn to Ephesians chapter five. Look, we're gonna get more and more violent today. Look at, look at, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like talking about this stuff. But the Bible says that it should be talked about in, in one case, and that's this one right here. Look at verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter 5. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. So look, these things, they, look, you need to be aware of these things. They need to be talked about in the case of reproving them. Amen. Look, you, you don't joke about these things. Right. You don't talk about these things in, in light circles, in the back. Look, they shouldn't even be spoken of. Amen. They shouldn't even be spoken of. But we are a society that has is, that is converged even on the, the topic of violence. We are for it. We are failing. I mean, look, that, that, is, that is one of the missions of this church is to protect children in this church. Did you know that? Amen. That's one of the reasons. It's biblical, but it's also one of the reasons that we're family integrated. Amen. It's one of the reasons I have all these dumb little rules that you guys are like, oh, why is he making all these? Look, we want to protect the children here. Amen. We want people, we want an organized structure where, you know, somebody that would, would want to come in and harm a child would not even, they would not even be interested in being here. Because there's no chance that's why all the security measures. That's why the ushers are given certain things to watch for and things to do. And I make these rules about, hey, the kids should be here and not here. Look, it's, it's all for the protection of the children. Because this is the kind of society that we're living in, unfortunately. But look, every single society that falls, before it falls, it experiences this same convergence. We are just, rec we are just failing to recognize these patterns. Look, I remember, I went to public school. I remember being taught this in public school. Imagine, public school. They taught us that 
every society that falls, they first go through moral decline. I wonder if they teach that today in public school. Public school is the moral decline. Public school is like the gas pedal for convergence here. It's crazy. What, what else? What else is politics? We see convergence in politics. Look, we all need to come together. We all need to find middle ground. We all need to come together. We see, look, we see nations themselves converging. You know, with things like, like uh, free trade, global taxes. I heard this one last week. I mean, the breaking down of, of borders. I mean, look, is this good? Should all nations become one? No. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Should all, nations, should all nations become one nation? You know what? God has a lot to say about this too. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look, the nation of Israel was moving into an area with lots of other nations there. There was nations everywhere. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 1. Should we just blur the lines between all nations? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the, per the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater, greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, utterly destroy them, and make no covenant with them. Look, don't even make deals with them. Don't find, please don't find middle ground with them. God is saying, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall make marriage, don't, don't marry them. I mean, if there's not a covenant, that's a covenant right there. Thy daughter shall not give to unto his son, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. For they will, why? Why? For they shall turn away thy son from following me, and they may serve, that they may serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Turn to Acts chapter 17. And look, by the way, this had nothing to do with race. This has nothing to do with race. Okay, because anyone that's, that's for, you know, anyone that is a, a, a nationalist, whether it be in Europe or anywhere in the world today, they're immediately just called a racist. This has nothing to do with race. The Bible says we're all of one blood, all nations. Acts 17 and verse 26. The Bible said, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Look, it was about adopting their pagan culture. It was about culture and turning from the Lord. Right. Nothing to do with race. Amen. Now, I mean, we're hardly a godly nation at this point. Right. Okay? However, God does not want all nations combining. Why? Why? Why does He not want all nations combining? Because He knows that Satan controls 99% right. of all nations. He knows that the minute that that happens, that is complete convergence. And God's people, wherever they are, will have a harder time in those situations as everything converges. Look, he knows where there, if there's a godly nation or even a godly group of people inside a nation, that they will need to remain separate. Convergence of cultures is not of God. That is not of God. So when you see that and you hear that, uh, that that's, not, that's not what God wants. Right. Satan is in control of this present world, folks. He is in control of this present world. He rules the majority of people in it, whether they know it or not. Look, I'm not saying that, you know, look, every government employee and all these types of things, principal, looks. They're, they're, just following, they're just following what they think is right in their own converged mind. Satan has these, the vast majority of people following him. They don't even know they're following him. Don't get me wrong. There, there's some people that are just serving him, and they know they are. But the vast majority of people, I believe, they don't know they're serving Satan, even though they're, they're carrying out his agenda is what they're doing. His goal in this world is to unite. Do you follow me? 
That is, that is the God of this world's goal, is to unite the entire world throughout all these different categories that I've talked to you about. The ultimate goal, turn to Revelation chapter 17. The ultimate goal in the end, and he will achieve this ultimate goal, the Bible says. The ultimate goal, you say he's, he wants to converge cultures and morality. He wants to blur every line and bring everything together. And that's what we see happening today. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. But the ultimate goal is this. The ultimate goal is this. And the Bible says it will be achieved. So, this is an information sermon for you. So you can understand what's happening and what's going to happen. Look at Revelation 17, verse number 12. The Bible says, "...in the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which thou received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast." So this, the Bible here is saying the same as in Daniel with the ten toes. These are ten rulers of the world that will give all power to the beast, to the Antichrist. And he will rule the world in a one world government. That's where this, that teaching comes from. The Bible never says one world government anywhere. It's right here though. It's talking about these main rulers of the world giving their power over to the Antichrist. Who is, who is carrying out, knowingly, the agenda of Satan? Which is opposed to what? Now, what's the problem there? What's the problem? What's the problem? It's one, well, well, look what happened. Read the next verse. Read the next verse. That's going to be very problematic for us. These, this government, these people in this government, the, the agenda here of the one unified government shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are, are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I mean, we win in the end. But this government will be opposed to those who are against convergence. Satan's for convergence, and we already saw that. Jesus is against their opposite, their opposite views. And the people that are following the anti-convergence agenda, they, they, there will be war made against them. The one world government and ultimately turn to Isaiah chapter 14. I Isaiah chapter 14. Ultimately, we'll have a one world government. We'll also have something else. Isaiah chapter 14, and look at verse number 14. This is why, this is why you will see every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world is works-based. You say, there's so many religions in the world. There's two. There's two. Every religion in the world is works-based, except this one. Right. You say, why are they all works-based? It's just different works, that's all. It's because, you know, it's kind of like you see, you see airplanes, right? There's lots of different airplanes. There's lots of different kind of airplanes out there. But, you know, I mean, they basically fall, all follow the same principles. They all have wings and a tail and engines and things like that. Look at Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14. This is why... All other religions in the world are works-based except what the Bible teaches, except the Gospel. The Bible says, this is Satan, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. This is why. So he can convince you that you can be in the place of God. Because that's what he wants. He wants to be in the place of God. I will be like the Most High. Turn to Luke chapter 13. One world religion is the goal. Right. One world religion is the goal. So he's going to unite world governments. Satan. He's going to unite world religion. Satan. Look, they're already pretty united in the, in the one aspect that I've already told you. They're already all based on works. There's just, I mean, there's just probably some bartering that needs to be done on which works. You know, I mean, that's the only difference that you see between, you know, the Catholics and the Buddhists and the Muslims and all these different things. It's just what you have to do. I mean, you have to do these things to get to heaven. It's just they all have different things that you fill in the blank and what I have to do to get my heaven checklist. But they're all the same. It's the same philosophy. So, I mean, if Satan's trying to unite everybody through all these different aspects, he's trying to unite everybody. I mean, and Jesus is the polar opposite of Satan... You say, what, what, is, what, is, what does that mean? Look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 12, I'm sorry. 
I fooled you. Luke chapter 12 and verse 51. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 51. Let me make sure I have it right here. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 51. The Bible says this. It says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. Are you starting to understand this a little bit more now? Jesus says, I'm not here to bring peace between all nations and bring peace together and have everyone united and everyone converge. No, I'm here to divide people. <laughs> I'm here to divide. From henceforth, there should be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. Even your own house. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You're like, man, Jesus is a divider? Why is that? Because of free will, that's why. Because God has given us free will to believe or to not believe. And most people are not going to believe. So, the people that believe and the people that won't move are going to be dividers. Everybody else is going to lump together. And the people that won't move are going to be seen as dividers. I mean, just think about this. The Bible's logical. I'm so happy the Bible's logical. I'm so happy that the conscience God's given me and the logical mind that you all have, it matches perfectly with the Bible. I had a conversation the other day with a young engineer. Think about this. Think about, think about just the, how, how illogical this convergence is. This young engineer, he had an idea. And I was like, oh, that's great. I mean, I love ideas. And we went and we, we, uh, you know, we did some due diligence on this idea and it just, it, we hit a fatal flaw. It just wasn't going to work out. It wasn't going to work. I mean, it just, it just wasn't, happens to me all the time. I've always said, you know, nine ideas out of ten are bad, even my own. You just have to recognize when those bad ones are and get rid of them quickly. But look, he, 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 this, I, I, was, I was completely shocked. Very young person. Very young person. I'm like, yeah, uh, it's just not going to work because of this, this, and this. And, and the engineer's like, but it was my idea. And I'm like, what in the world? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just said, you know, well, not all ideas are good. I mean, congratulations for having an idea, but not all ideas are good. But it, but it was my idea. I mean, must have said it three or four times. Wow. But it was my idea. But I mean, I had an idea, it must be good. This is a converging culture. Yeah. This is a converging culture. We get everybody in a room, and everybody has all these ideas, and there's no ideas that are bad, and we just, oh, oh, everything's fine. Oh, oh. And then the bridge falls over. Right. And then the building falls down. And then the power plant explodes. You know, it doesn't really work in my line of work. But the point is, this is what's being pushed. This is convergence. You have this majority, this majority converging, agreeing, and then you have this minority that, that won't move, and they're just like, yeah, but that's not right. Uh, fornication versus marriage, we're with this one, and we won't move. Well, I mean, that doesn't work in a converging society, so it's going to cause division. But look, here's one for you. There will be temptation to move. There will be temptation to move, because, I mean, people don't like when, you know, people hate them. And the Bible says that we'll be hated of all men. For Jesus' namesake, for my namesake. The Bible says that people are going to hate you for this. Like, man, I don't want people hating me. Look, I don't want people to hate me. But, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, because I'm not moving. I'm not moving from this. There will be temptation, though. This is how churches go liberal. This is how churches go liberal. You know what, you know what another, another uh, way to, to get Christians to converge is? Let's change the Bible itself. Right. You ever seen a Bible version that actually sharpens up doctrine? No. Every single Bible version, other than the, starting from the King James Bible, every single Bible version changes doctrine yeah, that's right. in, in, in the way of convergence. To converge ideas, to converge morality. We'll just call everything immorality. And we won't separate things out. Look, that's where it starts. 
And then you'll have churches that just like don't even claim to believe the Bible anymore. Even the false ones. But look, I mean, you know, that's kind of why we're a small church. You know? I mean, but it shows you how people can cave on their beliefs. Because on its face, it sort of sounds good. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. I mean, it seems harmless when we talk about putting a compass on a battery pack. It seems harmless. But look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 24. And this is why we preach what the Bible says on these topics. For this reason, Matthew 24 and verse 24. This is why I'm preaching this sermon today. The Bible says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Look, if you stick to the Bible, you will not be deceived. If you stick to what the Bible says about convergence and you know, division, you know that's why I'm preaching this, so you will be aware. No matter what, and it's easy for us because no matter what, our actions are the same. Look, you know, our actions are the same from all this. You're like, this is bad, this is crazy, what's going on? Our actions don't change. Our actions don't change. What are our actions? Well, uh, yeah, it's getting worse and it's worse uh, now than it was five years ago and it's worse, going to be worse tomorrow than it is today. What do we do? Well, we preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. Amen. That's what we do. I mean, don't go to work and be a judgmental jerk. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 to the guy living with his girlfriend. Yeah, that, I mean, that's not, you know, that's not what we're supposed to do. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and look at verse number 16. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Look, that works. I've gotten several people saved throughout um, my, my work life, and I don't go to work as a judgmental jerk on a bunch of unsaved people. I go to work, I work hard, and I... I separate from the things that I should be separated from, and I have speech that separates me like within five seconds of most people these days. And, you know, some people just, you know, they ask me. They're like, what's, what's up with that? Are, are your, your kids or what? How old are your kids? Oh, oh, okay. Are they drug addicts too? I'm like, no, not really. You know? And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm being extreme, but the point is that, you know, this is where your life, so people can see your good works, this is where it matters. People will want to know where that light comes from. And that will give you opportunities. But if, you know, they, they, you know, they have to know that you're not just some Pharisee. Because people are on edge about that type of stuff. Right. Just let them see your good works. And that will glorify your Father which is in heaven, Amen. the Bible says. But the main reason for this sermon is very simple. The last, I mean, Mark 13 is talking about end times prophecy. Mark 13 is talking about all of the things that are going to happen in the end. And the last word in the chapter is watch. So watch for these things around us. When you see, when you see everything converging around you, be like, yep, I remember. The Bible says this is going to happen. The Bible says this is going to happen. I'm not surprised about it. I'm watching. Certainly don't get caught up in it. Certainly don't get caught up in it. And recognize, recognize when you see all the convergence, whether it be businesses, whether it be nations, whether it be political, whether it be moral, when you see all that convergence, what you are witnessing is the battle between Satan and Jesus Christ. That's what you are witnessing. It's, it's very simple. It all comes down to that. Look, so many people are going to be confused on what they're seeing out here and why they're seeing the things that they're seeing. But it is simply the battle between Jesus and Satan. That's it. Amen. That's what it is. Amen. And guess what? We're not moving. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.